Jordan Vanna's professional conservation expertise is as vast as the Western landscape itself. After choosing a new career path, the former attorney held positions with the Green River Valley Land Trust, Colorado Open Lands, and the Colorado Conservation Trust. Vanna now works as a managing director for the Montana Land Reliance. Jordan, welcome to the Big Sky Virtual Town Hall. Thanks very much for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, Jordan, first off, can you begin by providing us with a brief overview of the focus of the Montana Land Reliance and its goals? Absolutely. The Land Reliance helps private landowners permanently conserve the family farms and ranches, the rivers and streams, the wildlife habitat, and those wonderful Montana wide open spaces that really define our state. We were founded in 1978, and over the last 42 years, have had the privilege of helping more than 1,000 families conserve a little over 1.1 million acres around the state. Those are acres that really help to form the fabric of our local communities, and it's been a real honor for us to work with all those landowners who have chosen conservation. We hold uh, about 12,000 acres of conservation uh, easements in the uh, resort tax boundary. We hold about 38,000 acres uh, of easements in Gallatin County, about 140,000 acres in the Madison Valley in Madison County, and easements on over 300,000 acres around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So um, again, it's been our privilege to do that work. We uh, really follow the lead of private landowners who choose to work with an organization like ours or choose to work with an organization like Gallatin Valley Land Trust or any of the other 11 land trusts serving the state of Montana. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a real honor for us. Yeah. Well, what are, what are some examples of current projects that MLR is assisting with? Well, we don't talk a lot about specifics in terms of current projects, but we are currently working on three active projects in the Big Sky area. Uh, we have about six projects that if they close will conserve around 14,000 acres in Madison County. We have a number of projects going uh, in Gallatin County. And this year, it's been interesting. It's been a remarkable year in terms of conservation. We have over 70 projects on about 170, 180,000 acres in the pipeline right now. So it's a real testament to landowners who, for a variety of reasons, are seeing conservation as a very good choice for their land, for their families, and for their futures. It's a, it's a gift. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that because when we spoke earlier, I remember you mentioned that that interest is on the rise. Um, what factors do you believe are contributing to that heightened interest currently? That's a great question. I think there are I think there are three if you boil them down. I I think in the agricultural land community, uh, the farm and ranch families around the state, particularly the generational farm and ranch families, who we tend to work with uh, quite a bit. I think those families are looking to use conservation easements and some of the nice financial incentives that are available to help pass land down to the next generation, to their kids and grandkids. You know, the average age of a, a farm and ranch operator in Montana, if I'm getting this right, is about 58 going on 59 years old. That age continues to increase and you've got a lot of uh, next generation folks who are interested in taking over those properties are beginning to get into agriculture and conservation easements are a wonderful way to help them do that. I think you have a lot of those families uh, and maybe even more so families in areas that are experiencing some of the uh, population growth, some of the folks who are seeing Montana as a sanctuary uh, during the global pandemic. I think you have some of those folks looking to hold on to the special values that brought them to Montana and their properties um, and make sure that their properties, if they choose to do this, aren't subject to some of the, the development that is going to be happening, particularly in an area like Southwest Montana. Uh, and I think you have uh, a lot of those families too looking to, to safeguard those properties, use conservation to protect them from development. And like Chet said, our organization uh, is also not an anti-growth organization. It's really a landowner service organization. And that's the wonderful part about conservation easements. They give landowners a choice about the future of their land and they allow those landowners and their families to make those choices uh, for themselves, often on places where there are generations and generations of blood and sweat and tears 
and hope and joy. Um, so it's just a, a nice opportunity to be able to help all those folks. A variety of different reasons, but a wonderful opportunity to be able to help all those folks keep their special part of Montana special. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you just touched on all of the benefits of, of uh, conservation easements, but I'm curious, you know, on the flip side, in your experience, what, what, are the large, what is the largest factor that could deter a landowner from agreeing to an easement? It's, uh, it's an interesting question. It's, it's so landowner specific. There are some landowners uh, who have property that they may have purchased or may have an eye toward developing, and that's okay. Uh, conservation easement may, may not be the right thing for them. The, the highest and best use of that land for them uh, may not be as open space or as a working farm or ranch or as habitat for wildlife. Uh, they may be hoping to put up new housing that will you know, house teachers and firefighters and you know, police officers and wonderful folks who make our communities work. Uh, there are certainly families uh, who are interested in conservation but are interested uh, certainly because they love their land, but they're really interested in some of the financial incentives and the financial incentives in a place like Montana, particularly as we continue to grow, may not be sufficient uh, to move the needle for them. And that's okay too. Uh, but really those, those are the two things. We talk with a lot of landowners, you know, it's funny, we, we talk with landowners who are immediately ready. They've done a lot of research. They've been thinking about conservation easements because it's a perpetual decision. They've been thinking about conservation easements for a long time. They have been talking with their family about it. And when they call us or when we meet them, they say, we are ready to go. Tell us what steps are involved in the process and we will do our end and, and look forward to working with you guys to get this thing done. And there are a lot of families who will take their time exploring easements and really have a series of conversations, sometimes over years and years before they decide whether it's the right thing for their land. We're happy to work with all kinds of folks uh, and can move as quickly or be as diligent as we need to. Yeah. Oh, another topic we touched on earlier when we spoke was um, planning and zoning and how that can be beneficial um, when you know, private lands are conserved. Can you expand on that? You bet. I, I think conservation easements and local planning and zoning work really well together, particularly in Montana. I've had some experience in other states uh, where the integration or the coordination uh, may not have been uh, as robust or as thoughtful as, as in Montana. So the you know, the wonderful thing about conservation easements is they allow private landowners to exercise that critical private property right to conserve their property instead of develop it or instead of use it in other ways that may uh, adversely impact some of the working ranch aspect to it, the open space aspect to it, the wildlife habitat to it. The local planning and zoning uh, is, is looking out and trying to make those communities as rich and diverse and eco economically sustainable as, as possible. And here in Montana, anytime a landowner chooses to conserve their property, the land trust needs to send the final draft of the conservation easement to the local planning board so that that planning board can review it and make sure that they understand how it's going to relate to the county's comprehensive plan. Those counties have the opportunity to review the conservation easement. They can't stop the conservation easement. They can't uh, prevent the conservation easement. But it's really a, a way under the, under the Open Space Act here in Montana that organizations like ours work closely with those county planning boards to make sure at least they are aware of and understand what properties in their service areas are going to be conserved, which landowners have chosen to exercise that private property right. So those boards can plan appropriately for the future growth of their counties. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, I'd like to take a step back for a minute, Jordan. You know, you were previously an attorney what led to your decision to, to get involved with land conservation? It's a thoughtful question. I started my career as an attorney in Billings. Uh, I worked with a firm that practiced real estate, tax, and estate planning work. And we used conservation easements as one of the tools, particularly in our estate planning practice, to help uh, many of the agricultural families in Eastern Montana pass ranches down to the next generation without having to pay uh, 
a significant portion in estate tax when mom and dad died. The estate tax regime was a little bit different back in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And I was introduced to conservation easements as a tool uh, in that forum, and they just spoke to me. They're voluntary, they're market-based, it gives landowners a choice about the future of their land. It doesn't require litigation, it doesn't require uh, advocacy. There are wonderful organizations that are doing important work in both of those spaces, but I really like the voluntary aspect of it. And I had an opportunity to do some work with uh, a small land trust that was just getting started in a, in a little town a little way south of Jackson, Wyoming. And I took a leap and I've been blessed. I was very lucky uh, that my career has, has embraced conservation. And it's a, this will sound silly, but I really enjoyed practicing law. I, I liked it. I love the people. I love the difference we were making in their lives. But for some reason, I always wanted when I was old and gray to be able to throw my grandkids in the back of the truck and drive around a particular place, especially a place like Montana, and share the stories of the families who had chosen to conserve their land and make sure that those properties, those ranches, those farms, those beautiful properties in some of our valleys were able to awe and inspire those kids in the same way they had me. So that's that's a real driver for um, for my interest in conservation and a real and a real passion of all of us at the Land Alliance. Yeah, well, I'm glad you'll get to do that as you as you had hoped, and that's a really cool story. How you know your days as an attorney led you to where you are now. Um, so yeah. thank you for sharing that. And lastly, as we've mentioned or asked a couple panelists already tonight, um, I would like to pose a question to you. What do you believe the Montana will look like? Montana landscape will look like in five to ten years. I think thanks to the remarkable work, uh, not only of the Land Reliance, but also the other 11 land trusts around the state, and really as a result of those choices that landowners across the state, from the Flathead to the Gallatin to the Madison to the Big Sky area, to all over the state, the choices that those landowners are making to conserve their part of Montana. When you look at a map of conserved lands around the state, we really are starting to build out some of those remarkable conservation areas. And I think Montana is going to continue to be one of the most inspirational, one of the most graceful, one of the most um, beautiful and remarkable places in the country. I think that will inspire some additional growth. I think we're starting to see some of that as a result of the global pandemic. But I think as a result of the choice that landowners are making and the work that organizations like the Montana Land Reliance and others are doing, I think Montana will continue to be one of the most remarkable places in the country and, and certainly that last best place. I'm hopeful. Well, thank you, Jordan. That is all I have for questions, but I would like to send it over to Joe to see if he has any follow-ups or questions from the audience. Yeah, sure do. Thanks, Brandon. And thank you, Jordan, for joining us tonight. Um, we really, really appreciate the insight and the work that, uh, that MLR is doing. You know, you talked a little about the time it can take to make a decision to put, you know, family land or, you know, put, put any land in, in conservation easement. Um, it's very personal, you know, and it's forever, as, as you've said. I'm curious, what are the reasons some folks give when they decide to place, um, place their land in these conservation easements? Oh, that's a great question, Joe. Uh, I don't mean this to sound glib, but it's, it's interesting. It boils down to um, usually two things. The first and foremost, and sometimes it takes a few conversations to get this, but the first and foremost is an absolute love of their property, particularly for the folks who have owned and worked it for generations and generations, a love of the property and an interest in leaving it better than they found it. For so many families that we've had the pleasure of working with, that, that rationale is the primary reason that they choose to conserve their land. Sometimes they're, they're able to express that. Sometimes you can just tell but that that sentiment of leaving it better than you found it and choosing conservation and a conservation easement is the way to do that is by far the the biggest reason i think a lot of families choose to work with an organization like ours and trust an organization like ours to help them achieve that goal the second reason certainly is some of the financial incentives whether it is the federal income tax deduction that is available for donating conservation easements whether it is some of the uh, 
government and private grant funding that is available to help organizations like ours in rarer cases, and Chet touched on this, in rarer cases, purchase conservation easements. Um, those financial incentives can really help families do a variety of things, whether it's, it's holding on to their land, whether it is passing it to the next generation, whether it is uh, purchasing pieces of property that are coming up for sale and expanding their operation, whether it is buying a new piece of equipment, whether it's sending a kid to college or paying for uh, or helping to pay for a son or a daughter's wedding. Some of those financial incentives are an important driver for conservation, but it really does start with love of land and, and wanting to leave it better than you found it. I, I don't mean that to sound silly. That is 99.5% of the reason that, that folks choose to work with an organization like ours. Wonderful reason. Can't take it with you. You can't take it with you and they're not making any more of it. No, they're not. Jordan Vanna, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.